So I am from Microfocus, who acquired NetIQ about a year and a half ago. We've got about 25 years of experience in the identity management industry. Well, Microfocus is a UK-based company. We are headquartered just west of here in Newbury. And I, I find it quite interesting that on the eve of your referendum for independence, they would send an American to speak to you. That's purely coincidence. Please don't read anything into that. But because I'm a visitor, I got to yesterday take a ride on one of those boats, you know, the open air thing, and uh, got a little too much sun. Who knew you could get too much sun in the UK? I found that out. But I went down to the Tower of London and got to see this great example of defense in depth, uh, great technology for the 11th century. And as has already been said, you know, there's this sense of moving identity to become the perimeter. But I'd like to challenge that thought for just a bit, because the reason is, is that users are really our weakest security link. This statistic has already been used today, but Verizon says that almost two thirds of all attacks last year were a result of the loss of credentials. So if that's the case, do we really wanna rely on identity as being the perimeter? So what I thought I'd do is, I'm gonna share with you 10 real world examples of people behaving badly or having their credentials stolen that might inspire you to take a closer look at how identity is being used from a security perspective. And then in my session at 1215, we'll go through some specific controls where we can actually think of identity as in fact being helpful from a security and risk perspective, but perhaps not relying on it as being the perimeter. So as was mentioned already, I'm a former naval officer and in the US military, we like to think of things called courses of action. Anybody like acronyms? You don't like them the way that the US military does. So we talk about COAs. We even have an acronym for acronyms. We call them TLAs, three letter acronyms. But at any rate, uh, COAs. The most likely course of action is the one that we wanna look at first and then the most dangerous course of action is something else that we'll take a look at. Maybe not as big of a threat, but could produce even more detrimental results. So we're gonna classify these uh, silly examples in those two types of uh, categories. So what are users really doing that expose organizations to risk? First, the most likely COAs. First one we'll call Social Butterfly Betty. In 2009, the executive assistant for the company Twitter, uh, she was the executive assistant for the CEO of Twitter, she had her accounts hacked. And the reason why is because she, like the rest of us, posted lots of information on social media, in this case, Facebook, which was then used to guess her password answers, you know, the challenge request when you wanna reset your password. Uh, the, the attackers gained access to her accounts and by extension gained access to the CEO's account and was able to acquire some very sensitive information that was fairly embarrassing for that CEO. Second example, of course, it's no surprise that phishing and spear phishing is, is a very uh, widely used method of attack today. The example I'll use comes from a source called the Verizon Data Breach Digest. I think that we've all heard of the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, but this one's a great read if you haven't seen it yet. So go look up the Verizon Data Breach Digest. But they used an example of a manufacturing company who's had, had a, an engineer who's uh, was interested in finding a new job. And in the process of that, uh, he had posted some information on LinkedIn and that sort of thing. And so there was a Chinese manufacturing company that decided they wanted the plans for something that this company had built. And they sent a phishing attack offering this particular engineer a new job. And of course, he was tempted to click on that. That allowed for the installation of malware, which then was used to acquire credentials and then ultimately download all the plans. And this particular company then was uh, basically lost that intellectual property because the competitor now had created an exact copy of something they had spent years developing. This one's a little bit different. We, so far we're talking about social engineering types of attacks, but this one also is used when someone can acquire the credentials of an email address of an executive and then tell someone within finance to transfer money. And this, this is what happened to Mattel. 
uh, last year. Mattel, of course, makes Barbies and Hot Wheels cars, and they lost uh, $3 million, which is not child's play, as a result of this. A financial, uh, someone in the financial group got an email from the CEO demanding that uh, that transfer of money occur. This was a brand new CEO, had been on the job for about a month, and of course the person in finance wanted to impress her boss, uh, and of course willfully did the wire transfer. About an hour later, she ran into that CEO in the elevator uh, and initiated a conversation about it, and he said, whoa, wait a second, I didn't, I didn't do that. And by then it was too late. The money was gone, and there was nothing they could do to recover it. Diligent Danielle. So this is an interesting one. New York University ran a test to find out. In this case, we, we, we like to think of, all right, multi-factor authentication is going to solve our problems. And it will solve some problems, don't get me wrong. But this is a case where it didn't. The uh, example here is one where there is a password reset method that involves proving that you have something that you have, in this case, a mobile device. And so when an external attacker is able to acquire the credentials of a username and password and then requests a reset of the password, it sends a code via text to a mobile device saying, do you authorize this? If so, send back this code that was sent. Well, of course, the attacker doesn't have possession of the device, but what do they do? They send a follow-on text to that same phone number saying, this is the phone company. Would you please share the passcode that was just sent to you via your device? And it turned out that 25% of users in a real-world world test were willing to then reply to that text message with the digits or the code that was sent to, to be that second factor of authentication. Helping hand, Henry. You know, we've all seen tailgating. We see people who claim they, they left their identity card at home. Uh, maybe it's a, an attractive coworker who wants you to log into the system for them. So these are ways that users can go around the, uh, the types of credentials that we put into place. All right, I, I, I hate to use a French example, um, but there, there, is a, there are plenty of other examples, both in the UK and the US I could use here as well. But, this one last year, um, some uh, attackers from the Islamic State managed to obtain the credentials of a French TV network, and it turned out that their password was uh, basically the English equivalent of QWERTY12345, as I'm told it's a ZERTY12345 on the French keyboard. But um, once they figured out that password, they, for about 20 hours, the, the station was taken down. They, they posted uh, jihadist comments on, on their social media sites and websites. Uh, and to make matters even worse, they, didn't, they then did a, a news story, expose, on themselves. And this gentleman stood in front of a wall of sticky notes with passwords posted right on them, exposing further information uh, for uh, anyone to use. So we all know passwords are bad. Multi-factor authentication is good, but, you know, it's the users, you know. All right, flash drive, Frank. Hopefully uh, you're not picking up any flash drives while you're here, but this one may make you take pause if you are. Um, in this case, the user, this is a, uh, an American example. This is, uh, I live just outside of Los Angeles. This is a studio that's based nearby where I live. This particular user had gone to a conference uh, and did not pick up a memory stick, but in fact was mailed one from that same conference with letterhead from one of the vendors that was there who happened to be a vendor that he already worked with. So he was familiar with them and he thought, oh, this must be a follow-up from the event that I was at. And he plugged that USB stick into his uh, machine and of course his, his machine was compromised via malware and, uh, and they, they lost a movie as a result, right? So think, think about the download of a movie prior to it being published. That's, that's uh, a, a huge impact on studios that make these enormous investments, sometimes uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in film. All right, so those are the most likely courses of action that I could find related to users behaving badly. What are the, some of the more dangerous ones? And of course, as you can imagine, these will be related to insiders uh, and particularly administrators. All right, this one's fun. Uh, you might have heard this story before, but there was a developer who decided that um, rather than actually developing code, he would just hire some uh, developers in uh, China. And in, it's because the, the organization decided they were implementing VPNs and 
tokens uh, in order to enable remote development efforts by their developers. He said, well, that's all right. I'll just send my uh, token on to China as well. So he sent everything over there. They, those developers uh, actually did an enormously good job with the code. The, this developer got really high marks for his code. But in fact, uh, he, he, was, he was making well over six figures and was spending only about $50,000 a year with, uh, with the outsourcing firm that he was working with. Um, so I'm, I'm sure we'd all like to know which firm that is. Maybe we could get a break on some of our development. Uh, but it, what happened was the security organization was monitoring the traffic on the VPNs and said, why is there traffic coming from China in here? That, that seems unusual, and, and that's how they caught the guy. Uh, but he had spent about two years watching cat videos and surfing Reddit and selling things on eBay. All right, that one's not too bad. That one's kind of silly, but insider E in here, this is the one uh, that's, that's really dangerous. So... Uh, the network AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph in the U.S., uh, has uh, a large mobile network, and some employees decided that for the sum of $20,000, they would uh, sell out their company, and, and they installed software that allowed an outside third party to then unregister phones on the AT&T network, um, and they did that for about uh, 200000 individual phones, and AT&T lost a lot of revenue as a result of that. But it just goes to show that uh, people are willing to sell out their credentials for uh, what sometimes, in comparison, seems like a, a small sum of money. And then finally, you've probably heard of uh, the Panama Papers, but this idea of hacktivism has suddenly gained uh, attention and, and perhaps more practitioners. So the, the motivation in this case, while it's still an insider attack, this is just a good old-fashioned insider giving away information, but uh, instead of being financially motivated, it's motivated by political ideology. And uh, just recently, in fact, last week, a Swiss newspaper reported that uh, they had made an arrest in the case. You hadn't heard about that. But again, something that, uh, that should be looked out for in order to protect ourselves. So what can we do about all of that? Well, of course, education is first and foremost. So there's great you know, phishing services that will test your users to find out if, if they've actually uh, are, are susceptible to phishing attacks and educating users about security and risk and what to look out for, uh, everything from don't tailgate and, and so on. Those are, those are good things. We should do that. But there are, are also controls that should be in place uh, from an identity management governance perspective, uh, those controls can go a long way towards improving our security posture. And I, I've, if you'd like to join us at 1215, I'll be uh, explaining how the inter identity intersects with security controls. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.